Hello and welcome, F5 community. I'm Aubrey with Dev Central, and I am joined today by Ken Aurora, distinguished engineer in the office of the CTO. Ken, how are you today? I'm doing well. It's good to see you, Aubrey. Likewise, likewise. It's been uh, quite a bit, I mean, with the whole no travel thing and, and whatnot, and usually I see it at just the International Sales Conference. Um, I'm hoping you're going to be able to make that this year. Yeah, I, I hope to make it. I, I don't know for sure. I hope to make it. I am looking forward to being able to see people in person, reconnect. That That is a great experience. Absolutely. Now, for those of you in the community, just curious, you know, uh, distinguished engineer, for me, this is a neat one. It always has been, um, you know, you come into this company as an engineer, one, you might be a two or a senior or a principal. And beyond that is kind of where we end up having people like Ken. So it's always a good idea to get Ken's take on kind of the the broader view sort of things. So I guess with that, if you could, Ken, just kind of describe to the community what it is you do uh, on the day-to-day -day with the office of the CTO. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do that. I, Distinguished Engineer just means that I've been fortunate to work with some, some great projects with some great teammates over my 10 years at F5. So it's, that's an acknowledgement of how lucky I've been. Um, at the, uh, um, I joined the office of CTO about five years ago. I was in the product role before that. Um, the office of CTO is, you know, a little bit newer. It's been around for a few years in F5. And it has, th its charter is really cr across the different product lines, across the, the full portfolio. And we have three main pillars of activity we do. Um, the first is sort of technology excellence. What can we do to, to raise the tide for every, all the product development teams across the company? And whether those are things like common engineering practices, you know, how do we handle open source, um, secure life cycle? Those are all things that how do we just raise the bar to help all of the company? Um, the, the second thing is thought leadership. Take a, you know, look at what F5 has, but also we have the freedom to take an outside in view from the customer perspective, from the industry perspective. What's going on? What's, what are the big trends? And where do we think they're going? Um, use that to inform F5 strategically and also um, use that to... Um, provide some thought leadership to help position and brand F5 as a thought leader. And my particular part of the world there is in the security part of what our portfolio and um, very specifically one area I've been um, very involved with recently on that is zero trust. And then the third pillar of what the office of CTO does is portfolio alignment. And again, because we take a cross portfolio view, we can look across the product families and um, and look for commonalities and opportunities to either bring products together or to normalize things. So an example of an activity that I've been knee deep um, in that is um, one WAF. Um, I won't get into that. I think Gary's been on an earlier call and talked about talked about that with you. But I'm sort of the Gary's great at the messaging and the marketing, and I'm kind of trying to represent the the technical side of that world. Yeah, Gary's definitely been uh, been all about talking about one WAF with us recently. Um, you know, he's definitely shouting it from the hilltops and as we should, I think at F5. Yeah. Now, one thing that you mentioned there, uh, you did say zero trust. Um, funny, funny enough, uh, October is cybersecurity awareness month. And, uh, one of the things that we're focused on for the very first week in October, uh, is access. So zero trust really falls into, uh, into that category. And it's something that our users have asked about quite a bit recently there has been uh, there have been questions about you know um, where do we fit in access where are we looking to go in access and I can tell you having come from the sales team uh, as a as a pre-sales engineer for a long time um, that's one of those questions that that I fielded uh, fairly frequently you know what is the difference between this zero trust network access that you guys offer uh, zero trust application access and and you know where is F5 going to be playing in, in Zero Trust uh, going forward? That's oh, so really good. Yeah, I, I get that question a lot, too. That's why you're so not nodding a lot as you were saying that. Um, so the way I usually try to answer this or talk about this is um, I separate out the Zero Trust, the ZT part of those acronyms, from the, the layer, the level at which we apply them, the network layer, the application access layer, or some other layer. <clears throat> I think F5, and I'll get to this, but I think F5 has products that operate all these layers. And as we think about what's what's um, where things are going, some of our rec recent acquisitions also have a key role in terms of where we think um, Zero Trust is going to next. So first to start at the Zero Trust layer, there is a key set of principles. Uh, 
that I think embody what zero trust is. As a security practitioner, you could all say it all boils down to being paranoid, but but a, li- a little more granular than that. Um, some of the, prin- the principles I think about are use least privilege. Um, when you use least privilege, all, still always um, verify. And then you and verifying isn't enough. You still want to watch and you want to adjust and adapt. Those are key principles of zero trust. And you can apply them to the network layer. You can apply them to the application layer. Um, for those of you that are old enough to remember um, uh, NAC, Network Emission Control or Network Access Control, 802.1x, right? That was, in my mind, a uh, early form of the uh, the mindset of zero trust simply applied to the network layer. I don't trust who's getting on my secure corporate network. So I'm going to ask them to authenticate in some way. Technologies might vary. It might have been a certificate, not a password, but you know, it, it's all about, I want to make sure I know who you are before I let you into my network. Um, the world's evolved since then. Um, we just, you know, network deperimeterization, you know, any device, anywhere, whatever you call it, that's happened. That happened 10, 15 years ago. Um, and so the world had to adapt and you couldn't be network centric. That's not to say networks still don't play a role. They're still for say remote workers, VPN still has a key part, uh, key role to play. So in that sense, if you're in a, you know, distinguishing whether you're in a VPN or not is a form of network, a network layer zero trust. I'm going to trust you more if you're a network and you authenticate onto my network. But now for the general application world, I can't VPN you in if you're going to a banking app, for example. So now I need to do something else. And so, and this is, you know, Google popularizes with the beyond Corp world. And this is what's being called zero trust application access saying it's not rooted in your network posture. It's rooted in who are you as a user and, you know, maybe what device and what's your device posture like. Um, and, and the other thing that is part of beyond corp and part of user access is that it isn't good enough that you, you know, it's part of um, being paranoid. You're saying just because you know a password, you know, a shared secret, that's good enough, but maybe you really want to do something stronger like MFA. So I'm going to I'm going to have a higher bar for where you are. And that's also a very good and logical progression. And and if I relate this to F5's portfolio, there are things that we do in APM, big IP APM that, you know, are right up this alley that can do these sort of things. Step up auth, for example, um, if you want to do things like that. Um, This is kind of a lead into where um, I think um, zero trust application access is heading or needs to go to next which is to take a more nuanced sort of risk reward aware view uh, of everything. Um, it relates to r- risk work and relate to identity. For example, instead of identity being a digital yes, no thing, um, or having a policy like I always require MFA to make it, uh, make the requirement of, make and introduce the idea of a confidence level of identity. Instead of saying, I, I believe you're Aubrey and saying, I have at this moment in time, a 70% confidence for Aubrey. And that's this moment in time, depending on how you act and what you've done, I'm, my confidence in you being Aubrey might go up or down with time. It's not, again, a one and done sort of thing. It's an ongoing thing. That's another zero trust principle. Always watch and adjust. Um, so, you know, an, an example I like giving is a banking app. Um, you log into your banking app. You want to look at your account. Okay, you knew the password. That's good enough. I'll let you look at the account. You try doing something that has a different risk reward profile. Perhaps um, you want to um, make a bill payment. I might ask, I might say, hey, the confidence level to make a bill payment needs to be higher than the 70% you're at now. I need to get to 80 or 90% confidence. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, that's great. But um, hey, authentication system, how do I increase the confidence? And this might be, it might be uh, MFA, it might be something else. It might be, um, it might be, um, you know, calling somebody up if you need to. It could be a lot of things, but this it might be a CAPTCHA, for example, just to say, hey, I am more confidence than a human. Uh, again, relating to step up off. This is, you know, an adaptive step up off type um, use case. Um, and then, you know, finally, you can think about behavioral, right? If When you tie this to um, AI, which is the future where a future technology that we're all moving towards and marching on. Um, as we do behavioral analysis, look, depending on how you behave, if you don't start if you behave like Aubrey typically behaves, my confidence in, in you will implicitly increase over time. If you behave differently, my confidence in you being Aubrey will decrease in time. Um, I like this, that example also because, well, first of all, you know, this, um, the recognized product is exactly doing this. It's saying, if I believe you're Aubrey more and more with time, I'm not going to make you re-authenticate. 
And I like that example also because it's a way of demonstrating that better security is not a way, it does not have to introduce friction to the customer. It can actually reduce friction. If I am more confident, Audrey, I'm not going to put another barrier in your way. You've convinced me based on how you're acting. So I like that. Um, so that's one real thing. The other thing that um, I, I think where Zero Trust is headed is um, we don't have a buzzword for it yet, but I call it Zero Trust security. Think about workload to workload security. Um, I think because, and there's, a, there's a, a trend going on about how applications are constructed. Increasingly, they use more open source, more third party as a service or third party libraries. So that code is not code that, um, that uh, the application developer directly controls, it's, but it's sometimes often trusted. You think about supply chain attacks where I've got open source um, code that is, that's been compromised. Right, that's something I've brought into my into my application infrastructure, and yet it didn't necessarily go through all the checks and balances that a piece of code that I wrote myself did. Um, in many ways, this is the evolution that happened with firewalls and network parameters. Right, we had the castle and moat model, and um, even for network parameters, and we said we have very strong um, locks in, in on the doors and the windows, so that you can't get in unless you unless you've done a really good job. Well, what do the bad guys do? They say, well, I'm going to try to find a back door in. Then I'm not going to try to come in through the front door that's so heavily guarded. Um, and that's what they did. That's what attackers do with, with, with network parameters. That's what they do with, with application. They're saying, I'm not going to try to come in through the front door. I'm going to compromise the supply chain someplace or, or service someplace and come in through that path. <coughs> Excuse me. We're, we're, we're seeing quite a bit um, also uh, in the work that I've been doing with labs and, uh, and the security incident response team. Um, we're we're seeing quite a bit of, of package management type issues as well. You know where somebody has just let a, a a package maintainer has not updated his open source package for ten years, and yet all these other packages end up calling it and installing it. And so when you have kind of these these holes out here, yeah, that th there are a number of different things that can kind of reduce trust over time. I guess uh, you could say, and I, I happen to agree with you. In fact, all containers aren't even created equal. Yeah. You know, when a developer, like you were saying, you know, begins to put code out somewhere, you know, the differences, you know, even between uh, two different clouds, if they're going to use two of them. Yep. Yep. No, totally. Amen. So many different. Amen. Uh, you know, I saw some numbers the other day. I, think, I forget the exact numbers, but between 70 and 80 percent of code in modern applications today is open source. And if I remember correctly, the number was somewhere north of 80 percent of all of those applications have known vulnerabilities, at least one known vulnerability in there. So, so this is a real threat surface. Now, going back to Zero Trust, what can we do about it? Um, imagine taking those same notions of identity, whether device, identity, user identity, network identity, and applying the workload. Workload identity is, um, and watching the transactions that happen, not at the front door at your north-south um, parameter of your application, but what goes on inside your application. We need to do that. Um, and, and you know, there are a number of ways we can do that. And if actually relating it back to F5, there's the uh, threat stack acquisition. Threat stack does exactly that. It looks at system calls, which, you know, would include also network, you know, network system calls too. So you can look at communication paths um, between different workloads in a system. Um, and and you can use um, eBPF and a number of different technologies for that. You can use Spiffy to identify workloads. So you've got all these notions already. You've got a lot of the scaffolding, but we don't use it today. And where I think Zero Trust is going is now looking at those paths. And then you can use them to thwart a number of different attacks. For example, if I've got a workload that um, normally, let's say it, it pushes out log files, but because it pushes out log files to the file system, it, it writes to a, maybe a, a file on, on the virtual or physical file system. Um, let's say it gets compromised, you know, sort of like a log4j variant, it gets compromised some way and it might get used for ransomware. Now, you know, if we see this thing reading a bunch of files, which it doesn't normally do, and we also detect anomalies like it's reading these files it's never written, read before, and it's writing these files it's never written, and at a rate, right, all these anomalies that, you know, as a human, you would say, wait, this is really weird. We can, we would detect that and we'd say, this is a compromised workload. The problem is that today, a lot of the zero trust stops at the perimeter and doesn't look at what's going on inside. That is what one of the key things um, we think is, is, is really going to be important over the next few years. I think um, I gave some examples, if I could go deep, you know, I could, could, I can riff on this, go really deep, but 
ransomware attacks, um, supply chain attacks, all these zero day, days we would find. We're also well positioned at five um, using especially the technologies of threat stack, what, we, what we've done in, in eBPF and what we're doing with Spiffy to do that. And it ties right into our telemetry vision as well. So that's, uh, I'm really excited about where Zero Trust is going there. It definitely sounds like you've got your hands full these days, Ken. I, I'm having fun. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you were able to uh, take the time to sit down and talk to us a little bit about Zero Trust today and introduce you to the community. And, uh, you know, and always a pleasure to chat. I'll see you hopefully pretty soon here in, uh, in, in California. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again. I, I've enjoyed this. Awesome. Thank you, F5 community. And as always, have a great F5 day.